Well, as Tom said earlier, it's quite humbling to stand in front of this particular group of people and say anything about Africa because I think virtually all of the knowledge and expertise that resides in New York on Africa happens to be in the room this evening. So I am a challenge to tell you something that you don't already know. Um, I could speak a bit about my own passion for Africa, which runs very deep. Um, I think the I would speak to those of you who do not have a background in Africa and strongly encourage you to pursue the wonderful opportunities um, that are uniquely available in Africa. I could speak a bit about the scholarship program that you've been mentioned, which is my passion in life. I think the fact that you can go to Africa, South Africa, and make things happen in a way that is more difficult in more advanced economies is part of what has driven me to be so excited about opportunities in Africa. But I won't talk about those things. Um, I think we've all come here to learn something new. And it's been very interesting to learn about the entrepreneurial activities and to learn about Tom's activities. And so since I'm an investment banker, I thought that I would share with you some of the thoughts that our firm has around Africa today and some of the research. Um, if you've been leafing through the brochure that was left in your chair, then uh, you, it's probably stolen some of my thunder already. But um, I did want to share with you some of the information that we are now producing with respect to Africa. As you can see, our research area has recently launched a focus. We have a very deep global economics area that has just started to produce research on Africa. And um, why don't I take you through a few of the slides that will um, illuminate some of the thinking that we have. Um, in the first area, one of the things that our firm at Goldman Sachs has become well known for was a couple of years ago, we did some projections to take a look at those economies that we thought would be the largest in the world when you get to 2050. And that the we, when we did those projections, the four economies that are projected to dominate the world economy in the world in the year 2050 are Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Hence the term BRICS, referring to the emerging markets. Um, this term has been used, and this concept ha has really been a, a driving concept in developing economics over the last few years. And what we have done to take that work further and to look beyond those four emerging economies is what we call the next 11. And when you look at the next 11 beyond Brazil, Russia, India, and China, um, you start seeing um, Africa appear. If you look at the US, Japan, and basically the advanced economies, the growth in the next couple of years is 1%, 2% at best. However, when you look at the emerging economies, um, you look at China, you're looking at 10% growth, India, sort of 7 8% growth, and there's just a tremendous contrast between Europe, US, Japan, the um, so-called developed countries, and the growth potential that exists in the emerging markets. This talks about the, what I've referred to already, the next 11. When you go beyond those uh, four original countries that form the BRICS and you take a look at who's in the next 11, you see Nigeria. Um, interestingly, you take a look at where Nigeria is projected to be in the year 2050, and um, Nigeria features prominently ahead of the Philippines, Egypt, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about this slide is when you take a look at GDP on a per capita basis. And the fact that Nigeria is such a large and populous country, which is a tremendous asset in many, many regards. One of the things that you have to think about is the fact that Nigeria will be producing this tremendous wealth across a very large population. So even though we are projecting Nigeria to have um, a $4 billion GDP in 2050, you take a look, I'm sorry, four trillion, excuse me, a $4 trillion GDP in 2050. When you take a look at what that really means on a per capita basis, it's about 13,000 US dollars on a per capita basis, which still puts it pretty low on the list. You look at the others that are expected to be in the $4 trillion range, like Korea and their GDP is expected to be $90,000. So this still is a tremendous challenge of poverty alleviation on an individual basis, not just in terms of what a country can c create in terms of its entire economy. We can flip to the next page, um, which I'm gonna focus just a little bit on Nigeria because uh, and, and South Africa because they are the economic engines of the nation. Um, I think that, you know, as has been pointed out by some of the previous speakers, you know, Nigeria, <laughs> Uh, has a very important role to play as um, one of the 
most, as the most populous country in Africa going forward. And Nigeria has put together a seven-point plan. Um, they don't think about 2050. They're focused more immediately on 2020. And the Nigeria seven-point plan for 2020 is to focus on a number of very important social factors that they think will drive their economy. Education, security, provision of mass transportation, um, power and energy, a lot of infrastructure. Um, both soft and hard infrastructure, inf creating infrastructure among the human resources and in the land itself. Here we just took a look in comparing the four BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, relative to South Africa and to Nigeria. And um, I guess the upshot here is really the point that I've made already, that the Nigerian um, GDP is, you know, has to be taken into consideration relative to the population that the population of Nigeria is about three times that of South Africa. So oftentimes when we talk about who, where the um, growth is coming from, we have to think about people. But at the same time, the per capita GDP in Nigeria is only 17% of what it is in South Africa today. As you can see, South Africa dominates the left side, which shows the size of the capital markets. But in addition to that, one important measurement is the amount that is traded on each stock exchange. Because you can have a large stock exchange, but a true market economy is one that produces liquidity, one where you can get out of your stock as quickly as possible. So one that has a lot of trading activity is a strong and vibrant market. And when you re-rank the capital markets according to their average daily trading value, you can see that Egypt moves up the ranks ahead of Nigeria, um, and Morocco is still in number three. But they reshuffle is sort of the point to this. South Africa wins on both measures. Um, Nigeria is largest in terms of size, but Nigeria drop. I'm sorry, second largest in terms of size, but drops to number four when you look at the trading value. You can flip on to um, page seven which takes a look at foreign direct investment into Nigeria. I think what is interesting to note from this slide, um, I guess two things. Number one, this takes a look at all of the major investment that has um, gone into Nigeria, deals over $50 million since 2005. One interesting thing to note is that there's no capital that has come from the United States. Very interesting to note. The major sources of capital have been China, the Netherlands, and South Africa. I think another interesting thing to note is what industries have um, these, has this investment gone into. And you can see that it is very heavily concentrated, as Tom and others have, and Yuvin have spoken to in the past, the telecom space is just you know, growing like gangbusters. And many of these deals have been in the telecom space, as well as what one might expect um, a lot in the commodities space, um, in particular oil, as we all know that Nigeria is particularly rich in this regard. The last slide shows um, the foreign direct investment that has gone into South Africa. Uh, this chart uh, looks back from um, 2003. It's a little bit different. We also look here only at deals over 200 million, but I think the themes are, are uh, important to look at. First of all, you do see some investment coming out of the U.S., but still the U.S. is hugely eclipsed by other parts of the world, namely the U.K., China, Russia. Um, I think the other thing to take away from this is that, as one might expect, given that South Africa has a more developed economy, is that while you still see a lot of the same concentrations in terms of the industries into which investment is made, a lot in telecom, a lot in commodities, um, you do see some reflections of the more diversified economy of South Africa. Um, r relative to Nigeria. So you see there have been large investments made into the healthcare sector in South Africa. There have also been some uh, large investments in real estate. The Victorian Alfred Waterfront in particular last year um, was a very large transaction that reflects um, a strong interest in that sector in South Africa. Um, all of this I think is very exciting. Um, there is a lot to uh, there's a lot of momentum, pretty much anything you've read relative to the economy and the investment and climate in Africa over the last year has been positive. We know that um, Africa has benefited from tremendous export, export to the U.S. and in particular to China. If these economies catch a cold, as our country has, and should there be a slowdown in China, how will that affect? the economies of Africa. So those are some of the questions to think about as we go forward. Um, hopefully all of these challenges will be met and we will all have an opportunity to be as happy as the um, participants in Carol's film and be talking about 75% returns across the continent. Thank you.